would have thought he would have called you up when you, you got that paperwork from the judge. No, I only get called when the train is about one foot away and they want me to stop it. <laughs> Bill, what court was that? Uh, I think that was in the uh, United States uh, District Court that dealt with uh, the Santa Barbara area out that way. I don't know which court that is, but it, it was that one out that way. Uh, oh, that court. That was, that was a different case. That was in... Uh, that was in, uh, uh, I think it was Redwood City, up, in, up near San Francisco. Can we file our motions, our, our claims and motions online, or do we physically have to go into the court now? Some courts do, some courts don't. The ones that do, I think you have to pre-register as using that method. Okay. They, they, and they want facsimiles of your signature and, and various things, you know. Okay. It can be convenient if you're a regular customer of theirs. Um, let's see. Oh, no, it's... Uh, yeah. Okay, we're back in procedure. Yeah, I'm going to procedure here, action at law. Uh, here we go. I think this is it. Action at law. And here's a counterclaim. I wanted to show you the structure of a counterclaim. Okay. <clears throat> If you go to the website, the very first page of the website has a search engine. So if you know some key words, you can find this stuff. I use it myself. I forget where I hide things. All right, here's a counterclaim. And this is the proper form for a counterclaim in California. Okay, other states have other formats. First of all, you have your own contact information. Either the attorney's name goes up there or your own name if you don't, do not have an attorney. And so, and then you put your job title. In this case, his job title is counter plaintiff. Okay? Make sense so far, everybody? Yep. Okay. So, then you have here, you have the title of the court. The, uh, the upper right is all, this upper right area is always blank for the clerk stamp. Okay, then uh, you have, <clears throat> on the right side, you have the nature of the paper, a title. In this case, it's a counterclaim, and then a little hint as to what it's about for trespass and trespass on the case, and it's verified. Verified means that you are saying you're declaring under penalty of perjury that all of the facts that you put in there are true and correct. That's what verified means. When you do a verified uh, action or complaint, the other side must have a verified answer. Okay? That forces them to go on the line of telling the truth. Otherwise, they can lie and get away with it. The, uh, then you see the people of the state of California versus Anderson. Now, that's the original case that he's counterclaiming against. So, it's, it was a criminal proceeding against him. The people of the state of California versus Anderson. But this is a counterclaim. So below that, he puts his, what he has, okay? There we go. So in the bottom part, it's Anderson counter plaintiff versus the counter defendants. And he names all these people. Now, I don't think he names the people. Oh, he says, he, he couldn't read the signature of the person who signed the complaint. Mm. And when he went to the DA's office to find out, they refused to tell him whose signature that was. Okay? They have some strange idea that somehow that protects them. So all he did was, if you see right down here, he named him Complainer Doe, also known as People of the State of California. Right? So, you know, just because somebody won't tell you his name, that ain't going to protect him. 
You ever heard you ever heard the case of so and so versus five unknown IRS agents? That's a very famous case. Guy had no clue who these agents were, but he went and sued them anyway. <laughs> so that was compliant. But this is the structure. So you put the original case, and then below that you have the other case. Now, one thing to understand, when you go into like the county courts, if you Properly, if you really did it right, the counterclaim would be filed right in with the same case number as the original action, because it's really all part of the same package. But here again, you run into ignorance. But fortunately, we're saved by the system, okay? Somehow the ignorance is taken care of. So what, what we do, we, when, when you go down to the uh, court system, the whole county only has one court. I don't know if you realize that, but there is only one court in each county. All the courtrooms are divided up into divisions. You've seen it, division one, division two, whatever. It's really just one court. So when you do your counterclaim against this, uh, this criminal case, let's say, they will probably tell you, this happens quite often, you go down there and the clerk will say, well, we can't file this because this is really goes to civil. If you want to get really technical, there's criminal law, there's civil law, and there's common law. So it's really a separate category. Sometimes when you go to court, they'll say, oh, this is a miscellaneous case. Instead of calling it civil or criminal, they call it miscellaneous. Other courts, I've heard them call it a constitutional case because that's the only thing that covers it. They don't have a procedure worked out for, for this type of case because nobody ever does it. So whatever they call it, they call it, okay? One time I went down, I filed a case for somebody and the clerk, and we had this format just like you see here. And the clerk said, well, you can't use that case number because this is civil. So I said, okay, where's the, where do you want me to go for civil? So he says, go down to that one. So I did. I went down there. Clerk looks at it and says, well, you don't have this right. You've got you, you, this people versus Anderson. That, no, you know. So I said, okay. He says, you'll have to take it back and retype it. I said, okay. I said, what else? And he says, well, we have to put our own case number on here. I said, okay, what else? And uh, I th he had something else on there. I forget what it was. So I said, is that it? He said, yes. That's, all, that's all, all I had to do to fix it, and then he could file it. So I stood there at the window, and by hand, with my pen, I crossed out the top part with a big X across you know, through the lines. I manually... Uh, he didn't like counter plaintiff. That was the third thing, counter plaintiff, counter defendant. So I crossed it out and I said, uh, uh, plaintiff and defendant, okay? And, uh, and then the case number, I crossed that out and whatever the case number was going to be assigned, he was able then to stamp it. I said, how's that? He said, okay. <laughs> See, the rules say that typewriting includes typewriting and hand printing that's clear. Really? Yeah. So I hand printed. I knew that rule. So I just went ahead and did it, you know? And the clerk knew the rule too, you know? But they could call it all typewriting. So you have to go back and retype it, which I did on the spot. I retyped it with my hand printing. All right, and so now that made it acceptable. Now he never looked at the body, but the body of the action says Robert Melvin Anderson. Here and after Robert is one of the people of California, and in this court of record complains of each of the following, and so forth, right? He's complaining. And then he identifies them down at the end of the paragraph for each someone to answer said counter plaintiff in a plea of trespass and trespass on the case, right? Oh, this is the one where I called them all kidnappers. <laughs> okay? Down, down here, all collectively kidnappers, right there, see? <laughs> Out of the whole bank of attorneys for all these people, only one attorney objected to what I, us using that label. And you're calling it a court of record. Theirs wasn't a sure. court of record. Now, you, now you're... Ours is. And ours. Yes. So, uh, yeah, this is the case where we did that. So anyway, 
that you can see that we named them all, but you see how we established the Carter record? Really very simple, just say it is. It's all it takes to establish your sovereignty, suspend the judge, isn't that wonderful? What, <laughs> yeah. what I love about that, uh, I mean, look, I'm sorry, but I have to pat myself on the back on this one, but I made up that first line. And what I love about it is that it's so innocuous. I mean, who, it doesn't raise any red flags, you know? It's not like if you said that I am a, an agent of Jehovah, <laughs> you know, which no attorney is going to take seriously. But here, I just say that I'm one of the people, okay, yeah, yeah, one of the people, all right, and it's a court of record, well, everybody knows the court of record, it complains of, and it gets down into the meat of it, see? Easy enough. You, you said what a sentence. cannon you fired with that first sentence, you know? I mean, it just the way, all the things it accomplishes with just a few simple words. So enough bragging on that. But the, the thing is, is that that's critical because now, if the judge issues any orders, you just issue an order vacating it. Okay, it's called a writ of error. Keep that in mind, a writ of error, quorum nobis. Writ of error, quorum, spelled C-O-R-A-M, and the next word is nobis, N-O-B-I-S. Don't confuse that with writ of error, quorum vobis, which is spelled with a V. <clears throat> Quorum nobis means by us, in other words, this court. Quorum vobis means by, by a higher court ordering a lower court. By them. <clears throat> so um, you issue a writ of error, quorum nobis. A writ of error is only used when there is an error in procedure. And you are correcting the procedure. When the judge files an order into the, into the court, the error falls on the clerk's shoulders. Why? Because the clerk accepted an order from somebody who was not authorized to enter orders. It wasn't the creation of the order that was the error. It was the actual filing it into the court that made the error. You see that? Say the judge, he has his job. As long as he stays within the parameters of his job, he's fine. When he steps out of that, that, that role, he now becomes a stranger to the court. He's not part of the court in that capacity. So he's a stranger. Anybody can walk up to the window and say, file this order. The real error is when the, the clerk accepts it. So when you write your writ of error, what you do is you you attack the, proce the procedure. It was received in error from a stranger to the court, and therefore you order it removed. And then if you perceive the judge as a problem, you can also include in that order a direct order to the judge saying, don't do it again, or you'll be in contempt. Do you give examples of a writ of error that you uh, Sure do. Okay. We, got one, we, we got one in there which was, um, uh, resulted in a contempt of court mm -hmm. against the judge. What did that cost him? Nothing, but he changed his behavior, which is what we wanted. So you don't lose sight of your objective. Your objective is to get the judge to be a good boy on the bench, not to fine him or take money or put him in jail or anything like that. So you always leave escape hatches. Uh, a, a very good technique is what I call the cornered rat method. If you corner a rat, I don't care how small he is or how big you are, he's going to try and bite you. He has no choice. You know, he's cornered. He, he has no way to escape. So before you corner the rat, you drill a hole in the wall. And you let him go through the hole in the wall. Of course, there's a trap on the other side. But you see, then he won't bite you. All right? So when you go after these people, you try to leave these little holes in the wall to let them go through. Uh, when, you, when you let them go through, they may think they're getting away. 
in truth, you probably have him set up for a follow-up action because now you can claim an injury that he caused you because of this. See, that's, that's what we do. <laughs> okay. Well, right from the beginning, now, they injure you. Right mm -hmm. from the beginning. When they approach you, right from oh, right sure. the beginning. Oh, sure, sure. Now, here, here we have, uh, might as well look at this second paragraph on this counterclaim. Each kidnapper exceeded his jurisdiction by either directly through an agent or in concert with another, did cause counter plaintiff Robert to be unlawfully and forcibly carried away and imprisoned against his will, without jurisdiction or good cause. At the onset of the unlawful imprisonment, counter plaintiff Robert was duly engaged in good faith in a negotiation and purchase of a chose and exercising his substantive right to contract with another at arm's length. Said kidnappers without good cause interrupted the negotiations, then imprisoned counter plaintiff Robert. During imprisonment, the kidnappers took further casual, ill-considered actions to further imprison counter plaintiff Robert for up to three years without trial or due process. So this, uh, uh, what we're looking at is just the summary. This is not enough here for a lawsuit, okay? So we got the summary, and then later on you get down into specifics, okay? And so uh, and we say exactly who named who, when, where, what they actually did, what was said. That's when you get into the meat of it. But anyhow, getting back to this idea, you just have one court, okay? And, and, and so no matter where you file it, it's the same court. So they don't want you to file it with a criminal case, okay. Where do you want to file it? You want a civil case? Okay. So they didn't like the titles. It didn't match what they like to see in civil cases. Okay. There's another rule you should know. Titles don't count. The only thing that counts is the body of your writing. Titles, introductory titles, you know, no verbs, no sentence, just a, a noun, let's say. Those don't count. Sure, they help you get perspective, but they do not affect the meaning of the paragraph. So the paragraph is whatever it is. That's the real thing. So in the paragraph, we called him counter plaintiff. Up above it was called plaintiff. Okay? Now, in one of the papers later on, an attorney objected to this. He says, it's counter plaintiff here and counter plaintiff there, and he's all confused. He didn't, he, he didn't know what to do. So in our answer to his his paper, we simply said it's a rule of law that titles don't control. What controls is the paragraph. If he just reads the paragraph, he will know. <laughs> it's kind of fun to know those little things, you know. Titles do not control. Only the body of the paragraph controls. You say whatever you want in the paragraph. It doesn't matter what you say in the the other. Okay, let's see. Go back to this. Um, we can go to All right, so you know what the first line says. There's certain um, Yeah, this is, this is uh, the action. There's really no difference between a claim and a counterclaim other than how you arrange the heading and the fact you call the, the, the plaintiff now becomes the counter plaintiff and the defendant, well, you are the defendant, okay? And you go from defendant to being counter plaintiff. And the original plaintiff becomes the counter defendant. Okay? That make sense? Because you're going, you're reversing the process. And in this other case that we were just on, I want you to notice how we, we dealt with, uh, yeah, we said he exceeded his jurisdiction. So that's what this case is all about. We're challenging the jurisdiction. He had no authority. And the burden, we didn't have to prove anything. The, the burden is on him to prove that he did have jurisdiction. And of course, being a policeman or a judge or whatever, they can't prove jurisdiction over sovereigns. 
We do not yield. Okay, so far? Okay, so let's see. In this first amended action, I'm sorry, in, here we have the case log. This is in the example. You see over here, we have, we've been going to the foundation during the first part of this seminar. Now we're into the example, okay? I'm there to answer some of your questions here. But so the, uh, <clears throat> we had a demur, and it, first we did the action for trespass, and then the opposition demurred, the defendant demurred. Now demur is a very dangerous thing for the person making the demur, okay? Let me warn you, don't do a demur unless you really know what you're doing and want it to be a demur. Because what a demur d says, let me back up a little bit. When you file an action, your action really consists of two major areas. It's got a lot of small areas too, but the two major areas are what the facts are and what the law is. So that the law can eventually be applied to the facts, right? Well. A demur is just like an action, except it leaves out the facts. It just deals with law. A demur only deals with law. The battle is over the law. Why? Because everybody agrees on the facts. Okay? Joe Blow says, well, Let's see, what's a good example? Uh, well, you said if you file a demur, then the, yeah. the fact is already eliminated. Isn't it already right, involved? right. They, the they, they agree on the facts. All their facts are agreed upon. When you file a demur, that's your way of telling the court that there's no dispute on the facts. You, you, you are saying that all the facts are true. The only question is the application of the law. Okay? That's what a demur does. If you want to answer the facts, you do it with an answer. Okay? Somebody, somebody files an action against you, and you dispute the facts, then you file an answer. An answer deals with the facts as well as the law. But if you just want to argue the law and the facts are all correct, then fine, it's okay to say you agree to the facts, but then there's the law that you want to apply. And so, let's say, for example, somebody comes up to you and says, um, you poked me in the eye, okay? And then in your answer, you might dispute that. But what if it were true? What if you did poke him in the eye, okay? And then th it turns out the reason you poked him in the eye was because he attacked you. <laughs> well, that's a point of law. You have a right to defend yourself. Any injuries you affect e that you uh, cause on your opponent, are justified if he's attacking you. You use whatever force is necessary to stop the attack. Okay? So as a point of law, sure, you poked him in the eye, but you had to. That was your means of defending against yourself. Nothing else would have stopped him. So we're all in agreement of the facts, but the law is what we're arguing about. He says the, he says the law says you can't poke him in the eye. The other guy says, yes, I can if it happens in the process of me defending myself against your attack. Okay? So that's what a demurrer does. So you can demurrer if you've got all those facts just right on your side, and it is a question of law. But what these attorneys regularly do is they file demurrers. And what they're looking for is for some modification, for you to revise your lawsuit and so forth. Not me. I do the, the, uh, the attorney equivalent of acceptance for value. I guess you've heard that phrase before. What I, what I do is I say, hey, you're right. We all agree on the facts. I made all these accusations and you said they're true. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Now, whenever 
the defendant demurs, the court itself, take off your plaintiff's hat, put on your, um, your sovereign hat. Now you're head of the court. And the court now has a choice. When a party files an action and the other party demurs, the court can now go straight to judgment or can have a trial. Purely the option of the court. How about that? Yeah. I don't have a judgment. Huh? I just don't have a judgment to get the trial. Well, that would probably be my choice. <laughs> Especially if I'm writing the judgment. Yes, sir. So what you're saying is, since you're the court, you can actually issue a judgment? Or yeah. Sure. Sure. The judge can't do it. He's, he's a ministerial officer. He, he, can't, he has no judicial responsibilities. He cannot issue any judgments. Okay? What? It's kind of fun. We, we gave them 10 days to, uh, to reply. That brings up a good point. Whenever you issue a, uh, any kind of an order, whatever it is, always give the other person, along with that order, what's called an order to show cause. You want them to show just exactly why it is they do not obey the order. They can either obey your order or they can show cause, in other words, show the reason why they didn't. You always give them that escape hatch. The reason you do that is because of that other rule. If they fail to object, it means they agree. So when you, when you give them a full and fair opportunity to criticize the court's order and they don't do it, it's locked in. Okay. So here's a writ of error. This writ of error reverses the magistrate and grants the demurrer in part. What happened... In this particular case, there was the action for trespass, and it was sloppily written. And so the opposition demurred. And so the, uh, uh, the judge denied the demur. We don't know why he did. Usually they work against us on these deals. But he denied the demur. But you understand, it's a court of record. So the judge had no authority to deny the demur. Right? He tried to save him, that's right. So, but no, he denied the demurrer, which kept the suit alive. He could have granted the demurrer and said, okay, the case is dismissed or stopped or whatever. But the judge didn't do that. He denied the demurrer. Well, we had a problem, and the judge helped us out without realizing it. Our problem was is that we wrote a lousy lawsuit to begin with. Okay? There were certain elements missing. It just wasn't good. Well, this became our opportunity. And so we said, oh, no. First of all, the judge couldn't issue the order. But secondly, we agree with the defendant. This is a bad one, and it should be rewritten as requested by the defendant. <laughs> and so we then took that opportunity to create the first amended action, which you have since looked at. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, he had no authority to issue orders. Now, here is, first of all, okay, uh, let's see. You could have withdrawn your case and refiled it, though. No need to. We're already there. <laughs> and just file an amended. Okay. The demur by the defendant. I think we copied it for him. Yeah, to all parties, there was a notice. And he starts quoting Code of Civil Procedure. Well, as you know, there's no codes in common law, okay? But he's an attorney, what does he know? Okay, and then he, he says, plaintiff's complaint is uncertain, ambiguous, and unintelligible. Have you ever noticed how dumb attorneys oh get? They can't understand anything when they want to get rid of you, right? And so they, I don't care how clear it is, they'll always say, this is, this is boilerplate. They, they put this in on all their demurs. He says he couldn't understand it. Well, that was our linchpin. That's what became our excuse, see? Part of it. 
He says, an attorney is required to provide the court and counsel with a street address at which he may be served. Yeah, this guy was providing a post office box. There's nothing that says in the rules that it has to be a street address. And so a post office box is a good way to keep him from mailing bombs to you <laughs> or whatever. Um, and yet we didn't have a phone number either. Okay? No phone number. Anyway, uh, that, was, that was the demur of, that they had. Okay? Is, and, and here he says here, going back up and it says, the, the attorney said in his demur, the complaint clearly fails to state facts sufficient to constitute a cause of action against defendant. It was clear to him there were no facts, right? <laughs> Despite all the facts that were put in. And, uh, and so on he goes. <laughs> well, there it is. I mean, what can I say? All right, so here's the transcript of the first day in court. This is before we did the writ of error thing, okay? The, the action was filed, the demur was filed, and now we had the hearing. And notice how this hearing, notice how the judge acts in here. Okay. Mr. Jones versus Smith. The, the judge, where it says the court, that means the judge is calling the case, okay? And so, uh, Mr. Smith, good morning. Low Lo Sharknet on behalf of the defendant. We made up these names, by the way, but this is an actual transcript. Uh, Mr. Jones, you're, Mr. Jones says, good morning, sir. He says, you are to turn off that recording device or leave the courtroom, one of the two. That's the order of the court. Excuse me, Your Honor, this is, judge says, no, nope, that's a standing order of the court. He says, I have a problem hearing and I cannot hear very well. Well, we have a court reporter. I do not allow tape recordings in this court. That's a California rule of court, period. Well, Your Honor, I can't afford her services. Mr. Jones, there are ways to take care of that also. And how would that be? He says, I will, well, I'm going to explain some procedures to you. You may leave the recording on as I explain the proceedings to you, then you're going to turn it off, okay? Very well. Are you an attorney at law, sir? No. You filed a lawsuit in this court. I have to hold you to the same rules. Are you hearing me? I, yes. Well, tell me if you don't hear me, okay? Yeah. If you, if you could speak up a little bit, please. The judge says, all right. I have to hold you to the same rules that I do everybody else that practices law in my courtroom. Okay, those are the rules of the court. In other words, Jones says, which rules? <laughs> he says, in other words, I have to hold you to the same standard as anybody else that comes into my courtroom, including the attorneys who have knowledge of all the rules of court. But which rules are we talking about? California rules of court, period. It's called California rules of court. You notice how authoritative the judge is. I want you to keep that in mind for later. Well then, with all due respect, Mr. Jones says, sir, then I must object for the record. Okay, judge says. Jones says, I have, this is a court of record and we have chosen those rules that govern the procedures of this court. Judge says, that's right, I have California rules of court. I don't know what you're talking about now. <laughs> he says, well, I, you, well, do you have my action? Judge says, yes. In front of you? Uh-huh. Well, the second paragraph. Judge says, I'm trying to explain to you, sir, that you will comply with the California rules of court. By the way, he cited the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, okay, <laughs> which you can do. Okay. okay. And you, he said, you'll be held to the same standards as any attorney who practices in this court because those are the rules of the court. And so one of the rules of the court is we do not allow electronic devices. Well, that's a little unusual because I had, the judge says, okay, okay, you now, okay, I've tried to explain this to you. First of all, you're going to turn that tape recorder off. All right, he, he turns it off, okay? As long as for the record, my objection is put on the record. He says, you got it. Turn the tape recorder off, please. Thank you. Now, there are ways to go about getting transcripts and other things if you are not able to afford them. The Legal Aid Society, there may be some services available to you. I cannot give you legal advice on how to proceed on the case. I want to make that clear. I don't give the other side legal advice. Um, he says, I understand. And I cannot give you legal advice. I understand that. Okay, I'm telling you, you have to comport yourself to the California rules of court, okay? So do we have that understanding? Well, as I, uh, as I, underst well, I understand, but as I said before, this, sir, you brought a lawsuit in the, from the Superior Court in the state of California in the county of Calamity. If you do not like the rules of the Superior Court in the state of California, then file your lawsuit in some other jurisdiction that you feel would accommodate you better, okay? Well, as I said, just for the record, I object. Sure, said the judge. 
Joan says, this is a court of record. Now, see, you're all tuned into what this is about. This is a court of record, and this court has chosen its rules that will govern its proceedings. Judge says, I didn't pick them. They're imposed on us, but I follow them, and so are you, and so is the other side. See, the judge really hasn't read his paperwork. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. See? So, uh, <clears throat> uh, counsel, state your appearance. Uh, low shark net for the defendant. Judge says, all right, now we're here today because of they, they filed a demur on your demur on your complaint, and I'm going to resolve that because I don't think simply because he named the cause of action incorrectly. All right, now, uh, to recap here, <clears throat> the remedy is counterclaim, okay? Now, a counterclaim is simply a lawsuit or an action at law, and you know what the first line says in your action at law. Okay, and so you basically sue and you're challenging the jurisdiction. You basically are saying, no, no matter how you fancy it up, basically all you're saying is, I don't see where your jurisdiction is. Show me your jurisdiction. What's your authority? They will then reply, our jurisdiction is code such and such or section such or whatever they say. And that's when you come back with, this is a court of record, proceeding according to the common law. The statutes have no standing. That would be your reply. And then that's, that's it. You cut off there, see? So you make your complaint. They answer. You reply to the answer. And now it's judgment time. Okay? <clears throat> you don't have a trial unless they ask for a jury trial. The trial is the paperwork in common law. Okay? Quickie on that one. <clears throat> Let me go to the uh, procedure here. And we have uh, action at law. Uh, I think this is, this is the right one. Okay. <clears throat> Elements of common law action. The, the, here, here's, uh, in a nutshell, you have the, the plaintiff makes his action, also called a complaint, also called a declaration. <clears throat> the defendant then demurs or he continues the pleading with his answer. <clears throat> Okay, then the third step is that you have the replication. All right. At that point, you have a forced joinder. That's a fancy way of saying, that's it, guys, no more papers. Now, under the old common law system, you could go continuously on, but you're supposed to narrow down the issues. Well, but in modern times, they say three papers are enough. Um, I never argue that point. I'm happy with three papers because I get the last word in, <laughs> okay? All right, and then uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things we have on here is the common law causes of action. This is a quick summary of what they are. There are 11 causes of action that you can have under common law, 11 choices. You can have trespass, Trespass on the case, trover, okay, ejectment, detinue, replevin, debt, covenant, account, and special assumpsit and indebitous assumpsit. Oh, wow. These are all, this is all easy reading. You, uh, I know these are strange words. We're not going to go into all these different words. The, the thing that usually you deal with is either trespass or trespass on the case. The others don't really apply. You're not usually collecting a debt from the IRS, okay? So you wouldn't use the action for debt and so on. So you can read through them. It, it, if you read them carefully, you can see it's really not all that complicated. So the special assumption that uh, you could sign that when they give you a ticket instead of signing your signature <clears throat> at the bottom? Well, I'll tell you what. I, I don't remember what each of these mean. I always have to look them up each time. When I, when I start a new suit, I read every one all the way through and get a, a, a reminder again exactly what it is, and then I decide. Well, that's what he said. They 
Well, that's right fine. There. That's okay. And the point is, is that you have the choices, and do like I do. Don't don't be so smart. You think you remember everything. Just go back and read it. Short reading. There are, there's only eleven of them, and they're not long. And it's very succinctly <laughs> stated what each one is. Cool. Okay. Okay. Pardon? It was a defendant under common law, under the complaint of common law actions. Well, yeah, you have defendants. Uh huh. Sure. Yeah, a lot of the language is common to both styles. Okay, the uh, see what this says about caption. <clears throat> this is a typical caption for California. Okay, and other jurisdictions. All right. Yeah, this is for normal action. And then further down, we have one here. This is a, an example of a counterclaim, how you would lay it out. Just showing the form is all. And then this one here, oh, this is, a, uh, this is a different format. This is how it's done in Florida. I put it there because I did a case in Florida one time. So that's that. These formats will work whether we file LA, Orange County, San Diego. Superior courts. Oh yeah, in, in, in within a state, it's uniform throughout the state. But you know, if you ever have any question about format, of course you can read the rules, but just go down to the court, pick any case, pull it out and see what how they laid it out. That's the easiest way. Uh, let's see. This is a counterclaim for trespass and trespass on the case. That's one we looked at earlier. Okay, so it shows the layout again, which we already had seen that. And so then you have, uh, let's see, first cause of action, trespass. Okay, laid out in the usual format, mentioning court of record and all that. So <clears throat> the um, major elements Basically, here's what you got. You have the cause of action. <clears throat> you can have an introduction if you want. Remember, when you're writing these things, not only you're writing legally, but you're also writing for somebody who doesn't want to read. Uh -huh. So you want to make it as easy to read and not get it too cumbersome and complex with too much detail. You only put in the detail necessary to prove the point, and that's good enough. It's, uh, <clears throat> let's see. You have uh, the, here. We have the specifics. We had an introduction, then we had the specifics, and then we go down here. And uh, I know we're going to get to it eventually. <clears throat> As we buzz down, here we go. I think I passed it. Oh, that's the second cause of action: trespass on the case. Third cause of action. Okay, and then the law of the case. Now in this case, <clears throat> in this case, rather than, li the, the case was already cumbersome, it was getting thick. So to cut down on the basic paper, remember most of your courts, they have a rule that says no more than 15 pages. If you have to go more than 15 pages, you have to apply to the court for permission to have more pages. But what you can do is you can have exhibits. So you say, like here on paragraph 37, we said, exhibit G is incorporated by reference as though fully stated herein. So here we had a whole, a whole bunch of pages more, but they're set off to one side. Do you use the legal form of the 8 by 14? All the courts are going to letter size. None of them really like it anymore. I, I, I don't know any courts that I've been in that want legal anymore. You know, standard filing cabinets are cheaper than legal filing cabinets. So I think, you know, they're, they're driven by economics. Okay, and then after you put the law of the case in, you put in a request for relief. You have to tell the court what you want. So you want, in this case, uh, in the request, Request relief and judgment against the counter defendants as follows. 
counter plaintiff prays judgment against counter defense in each of them as follows. That's an error there. That paragraph got repeated twice. Shouldn't have. <laughs> On all causes of action, want for general damages in the sum of $50,000 multiplied by the number of days in constructive and actual imprisonment. The loss of earnings according to proof that the court enter a declaratory judgment that defendants have acted arbitrarily and capriciously, have abused their discretion, and have acted not in accordance with law but under color of law. This is a declaratory judgment. Declaratory judgment is where you're asking the court not for money, you just want the court to decide what the position of the parties is. Okay, so that's one of the things. That the court enter declaratory judgment that counter defendants have acted contrary to constitutional right, power, or privilege. That the court enter a declaratory judgment that counter defendants' actions were in excess of statutory jurisdiction, authority, and short of statutory right. <clears throat> that the court permanently enjoin counter defendants from interfering in any way with counter plaintiffs' lawful right to negotiate, negotiate and enter into contracts. That the court enter a declaratory judgment that the records of the court not of record are impeached for want of jurisdiction in the court or, see, we sued the court too. So we want him enjoined. And, and stated those records are, are wrong for collusion between the parties and for fraud in the parties offering the record in respect to their proceedings because there was some fraud involved that the court grant counter plaintiff his attorney's fees that the court grant counter plaintiff uh, for such other and further relief as the court deems proper and that paragraph although it, it, in one sense, it opens the way for the court to grant more than what you asked for if the court decides that's proper. But the fact of the matter is, is that you don't need that paragraph to get that benefit out of a court. Okay? However, the general rule of operation in practical terms is they won't give it to you if you didn't ask for it. So okay? better to put it in. Yeah, but you're writing the lawsuit yourself, or you're writing the judgment yourself anyway. Okay? for cost of suit. Cost of suit include filing fees, cost of service, that kind of stuff. That's what I mean by cost of suit. Okay? So, that's that. Now, attorney's fees is always a separate item, but since... Yeah, that's separate from cost of suit. That, suppose we hired someone to help us Along the way, someone like you, how would you call Well, it? you can collect you can collect attorney's fees even if you didn't have an attorney. You're on time. Yeah, they, there, there's there's case law in that that you, you can do that. But normally you cannot collect attorney's fees. The only time you collect attorney's fees is if let's say it's in your contract where the parties agree in the contract that the loser pays all the attorney's fees. That's one condition. Another condition is if statutorily they say that in such and such a case, like civil rights suits, a lot of times you'll see it's written right into the codes that you get attorney's fees too. But that has, you have to have that special provision. Otherwise, you're on your own with attorney's fees. Right. Our dealings with the IRS, we're not going to do Yeah. Well, well, you might make a civil rights case out of it. I don't know. Anyway, law of the case. You remember we said attachment G? So here we have the law of the case. The law of the case is decreed as follows. Now remember, we incorporated all of this by reference as though fully stated herein. So that's the key phraseology. And then we started quoting from things. It is the public policy of this state that public agencies exist to aid the conduct of the people's business, blah, blah, blah. California Co Government Code, section 11120. Now, I, you remember I told you that, that code, statutes and codes do not apply, okay? We are going according to uh, common law. The common law says that if you suffer an injury, you're entitled to uh, compensation. And if that person has an obligation, he must fulfill that obligation or pay the damages or pay the injuries, injuries, injuries caused to you. That person that you're suing is probably a citizen of the United States or a citizen of the state. If he is, he's subject to the codes, isn't he? That's his obligation. So I would use the code that he is obligated to wow. for his failure to obey his obligation. Not my obligation, doesn't apply to me, but it applies to him. 
Okay? Now, in all of this discussion, Bill, you're talking about a, a California court. This is a any court, court, any court, state. Not a tax court, right? Well, it's any court, any state. You know, you, you have a set of rules that they operate by or the, or the citizens operate by or whatever it is. You have to, you have to search them out and apply them. What I'm asking is, uh, mm -hmm. the first, you know, I'm not sure what some of these people like Clark and Rose, some of those people were, you know, taken into some uh, tax court on uh, Terminal Island. And I don't Beach. know. That's not, that's not, a, that's not a, a court of record. That's right. Unless it's a tax court, then that it, it is a court of record. Terminal you remember I read that? You did, you did. Yeah. Not, not the franchise tax board. No, no. no. Right. right. Franchise tax board, I would say that one's pretty easy because you, ha you do not yield your sovereignty to the agencies which serve you. If they can command you to do something, then you don't have any sovereignty. Right? So you assume it's your court, bring those rules in because those rules apply to them. They're dedicated. Those officers take an oath of office, or they should. They're mandated to take it by their constitution. So you hold them to their obligation. And their obligation is to leave the sovereigns alone. Okay? Uh, excuse me, Bill, mm -hmm. but the Franchise Tax Board is poised and ready to grab my bank account. Sure. And they say that in a threatening, demanding letter. Well, of course, you gave them every indication you're a citizen, probably. No, I did not. Okay. I did you sue them? Did you sue them? Did you sue them? Did you sue them? Yes. Well, there's the problem. You can't defend against these things. You have to attack. Okay. Counterclaim. In other words, I have to extend all my time. Yes. 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 Freedom's not free. These people have no jurisdiction. Mary, freedom is not free. Okay, well, that's the price you have to pay. This is your tool of offense to go after them. Absolutely. Do a counterclaim on them, or if, the, if they're bugging you and they haven't sued you yet, do an original claim. But go after them for everything that is causing you a problem. See? Otherwise, they're just rolling on. They know they're not worried about you. You know, holler all you want. That doesn't mean anything. You've got to actually pull them into court. What you need to do, though, is get their name and employee ID number. And if you can't get it, you get their boss. And if you yeah. can't get that, you get the top yeah. manager. Yeah. Somebody's got a name. Mm -hmm. I'm in the process of getting the name, badge number, That's what title. You yeah, but, but you don't have to have it. You understand that? Mm -hmm. You go after whoever's... You, get, you go after the lowest name you can uh, find that's above whoever you're looking for. Yeah. And if he won't tell you who they are, you sue him because now he's part of the problem. I'll give you the executive director's name. Sure. Okay. You know what? Isn't it? It's on the computer now somewhere. Okay. No? Oh, okay. I'll take that. The name will be on the way. Okay, so what we do here is we, we, quote, we quote these laws or we quote these codes that they are obligated to. Now what's interesting about this is that here we cite where we got it from. Okay. Remember this, the words come from the codes, the authority comes from the sovereign. Okay? okay? So when the sovereign, the law of the case is decreed as follows, and you decree these laws and you show the references where you got the wording from. California Government Code, Section 54950, okay, or whatever it is. So you, you put that in there. The attorneys come along, they think you're working with code law. No, you're in common law, and, and you're injured because they didn't follow their obligation. You see that? You're not bringing in the power of the state. You're bringing in your own power of you, the sovereign. You decree the law subjecting to the law, but they are citizens, they had a predetermined obligation to follow these rules anyway. Okay? So you just remind them of it. Yeah, in a sense, but you're, you're laying it out here. And so here's a whole bunch of stuff. We've got six pages of, of rules that, that apply to them in this particular case. We also define what a court of record is. Here's a court of record, and here's the judicial, here, are the uh, 
prior case law that applies these things. See, I told you everything I put in here is backed up one way or another. So a judicial, a court of record, going up here, to be a court of record, a court must have four characteristics and may have a fifth. They are A, a judicial tribunal having attributes and exercising functions independently of the person of the magistrate designated generally to hold it. That's Jones versus Jones, 188 Missouri Appellate Court, 220. Then it's in Southwest. You got ex parte Gladhill and so forth, see? Those are the cases that support that aspect of a court of record. And so we've got all four of them are well documented. Okay. The following persons are magistrates. And since this is a California orientation, we got California cases. So far so good, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what you do to deal with them. But the beauty of it is, remember, somebody here forgot it just a few minutes ago. Remember, the tax court is a court of record. Why? Because the federal government voluntarily gave up their jurisdiction and said, this is what it's going to be. And we're committed to that. Okay? So what's a court of record? Proceeding according to the common law. Right? Magistrate can't make any decisions. Right? <laughs> so it's, it's really nice. People have been using this in, in the tax court. They've been going in there and they've been issuing orders, vacating the, the, the decisions. But remember, whenever you issue an order, be sure to put in all these things, the law of the case and so forth, because you need to educate these people. And don't take a shortcut. Every time you issue an order in your case, be sure to repeat all of that in each order. You don't want them to just see the order and not see the reasons that you're boss and they're not. Okay, so... Fortunately, if you're using a word processor and not using a typewriter, you just do cut and paste. Okay, just copy it over. It's real easy to do. If I'm particularly angry at somebody, I think they're really trouble. What I will do is I will, and I have multiple, you know, people that I'm suing or whatever. I will sometimes make copies uh, and then I'll modify them slightly. So each one's really different. It forces them to read them all. Okay? I'll give you a good example. Habeas corpus can be filed in more than one court at the same time. Regular lawsuit can only be filed in one court at a time. But a habeas corpus can be filed in any. So one, one case we did, it was a particularly serious problem with this judge. And so we filed a habeas corpus in every possible court that might have jurisdiction. This was in the, uh, this occurred in the uh, United States District Court. So we filed a habeas corpus at the United States District Court level, the appellate court level, the Supreme Court level, the state superior court, the state appellate court, and the state Supreme Court. So that was six courts right there. All on the same day, each habeas corpus was slightly different just to make them work. <laughs> okay, these guys, they, they wanted to play dirty pool. All right, we'll play dirty pool too. But in an honorable way. <laughs> there are legitimate changes done by choice. Okay, so um, your lawsuit is going to be just like a normal lawsuit, remember, except the first line has that special wording, and you have the decree where you decree the law. Other than that, they're the same. It's a regular lawsuit. Action at law. It's an, yeah, it's an action at <laughs> law. Thank you. Thank you. I stand corrected. <laughs> I got to be careful how I talk now. So, um, <clears throat> on this website, we have elements. Uh, let's see if I got it here. Uh, I don't see. Court papers, okay? Court papers are letters to the court in a special court format. Okay. In an action, oh, here we go. A motion. Look at the motion part. A motion to the court to do something could consist of the following. A notice of motion, the actual motion, 
The notice of motion, that's a one-pager, almost a one-liner, okay? You're just giving them notice, you're making a motion. Then the actual motion itself, that's usually one or two lines. And then you have the law of the case and you have the facts. That's the affidavit part, okay? You put in the law of the case and then you have a brief. Now the brief, also called points and authorities. In California, they say points and authorities. In other states, they say brief. But basically, what a brief does is it brings the whole picture together. So a brief states what the law is, states what the facts are, connect it, it, but not as an affidavit. It states it as a pulling from your affidavit, okay? And it paints the picture. This is your argument, your cart argument. You say what is, and then, um, and then you have to serve people with it, so you serve them. And you have to inform the court that they've been served, and that's what a proof of service is. Proof of service is merely a statement saying everybody got a copy. Okay? And then finally, you might have a proposed order. Now, here's an interesting fact. Attorneys are not allowed to present proposed orders. But you in your sovereign capacity, you can. See, the, an attorney cannot present a pro proposed order, but you can. Now, what happens, you go to court, if the judge makes the decision, the judge will then instruct the winning side to write up the order. That's okay. But when making the initial uh, motion, they're not allowed to put a proposed order in. That's in the rules. Now, a lot of them violate it and do it anyway. You know how that works. <laughs> but <clears throat> basically, that's it. On proof of service, do you, do you use the marshals, or do you find it effective just doing proof of service by mailing? Whatever way, whatever way you can. Well, oh, I see what you're saying. Well, I've never been clear on this mailing thing, OK? The, uh, um, I know that if there's some difficulty in serving, sometimes you can serve by mail. But the bottom line is they prefer that you either serve them directly or uh, do what's called a substitution of service. In other words, you couldn't find them to serve them directly, so you, you deliver something to whoever opens the door at the home or a business office, and then you mail a second copy to the same address. And that two-pronged service substitutes for the single-pronged service of giving it to them directly. You, if you look in the, uh, in the procedures, the, the, the legal codes on how to serve, you'll find there's a half dozen different ways to do it. If you, can't, if, if you know the person's hiding in there, never answers the door, but you know he's there, go back to the court, tell the court what your efforts were to try and serve this person, and say, let the court know that somebody's hiding there and ask for an order allowing the sheriff to force his way in and serve the person. Okay? That's another technique. If you can't find the person, <coughs> you can serve him by publication. And some jurisdictions require that you uh, ask the court permission to file by publications. Others say you can do it automatically. Okay? And then finally, if you can't find the person anywhere, you can serve the Secretary of State. And it's his problem to find the person and get the papers to him. <clears throat> so there's, there's lots of different methods. You cannot hide from court procedures. That, that stuff of you know, hiding from service doesn't really work if the person knows. Might be a little bit extra time, but that's about all. Yeah, you can, yeah, you take longer, but they can't hide from service because if nothing else, you serve by these alternative methods, and then even if they never heard of you, they, they default. Same. Same way you serve everybody else. Hire, you might use the marshal, that'd make it a little easier. But I've served judges simply by going into the courtroom and, and handing the paper to the gatekeeper. Who's that? That's the marshal right there at the court. Okay, because court's in session, I'm not going to interrupt the judge. And I say, I have these papers to serve to him, and here they are. And then he might try to turn them down. We've had him actually force right them. Me. 
Yeah, he, right, right, this guy got rid of the papers. Yeah. <clears throat> no, he's got it. You know, when you give it to him, that's gone. You, you have, he can stuff them all you want. You can walk off with them in your pocket, but you didn't put them there. I just, I just went downstairs, and there is someone I can just go to this one. Well, that, yeah, that's, here, yeah, that plan B. Stuff, plan B. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Down, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes they have special personnel designated to receive service. If somebody, yeah. if, if, if I run into a snag, I don't get hard boiled the first time around. I say, okay, well, how should I serve this? I'll ask the person, do you, do you have a procedure for it and so forth, you know? And usually there is, so it's, it's not like it's a problem. A lot of problems are created by, created by us ourselves, you know, just by being, you know, too pushy or something. When when a simple right little, yeah, when a when a, a simple polite question, they might just say, okay, here's where you go to do that, and say yeah. thanks, you know. So uh, there you are. I guess uh, it's uh, time to quit. It's 9:06. Oh, good night. And we covered it all. Yeah.